Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjay Guha Thakurtha and we are going to discuss the state of democracy in India. We keep describing our country as the world's largest democracy, whereas others have described this country as a failed democracy, as an electoral autocracy. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, in his speech from the ramparts of the Red Fort on the 15th of August, described India as the mother of democracies. So what are, what is democracy in the Indian context? Its strengths, its limitations, its successes and failures. To di discuss this subject, I'm very happy to welcome to the studio of NewsClick, Professor K.C. Suri. Dr. Suri retired recently from the University of Hyderabad, the Department of Political Science. He's been a teacher for 38 years and an ardent observer and analyst of India's democracy. Professor Suri, let me start by asking you a question about the report that was presented in March 2022 by this Swedish institute called Varieties of Democracy Institute, VDEM Institute. And the report had a year ago in 2021 described India as an electoral autocracy. They work out this kind of a index, a liberal democracy index, and they have claimed that India's position has worsened and it is among the top 10 autocratizing nations and the democratic slide is continuing in India and India falls into the category of countries like Brazil, Turkey and Hungary where there's been a downslide and the, this particular report uh, says that all this has happened largely after 2014 when Prime Minister Narendra Modi became the Prime Minister of India and naturally the government of India is not at all happy with such a report and says that these reports are by Western organizations based on flawed methodologies. So this is my first, your observations on this particular report. Yeah, I think uh, there are uh, <clears throat> several organizations, uh, Paranjay, who are engaged in assessing democracies all over the world. Uh, there are four or five agencies which are well known throughout the world, like Freedom House. Then there is uh, this institute called International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance in Stockholm. There is Economic Intelligence Unit based in London. And, and this uh, Varieties of Democracy project that is called VDEM project now. It is uh, uh, founded and led by a professor called Stefan Lindbergh. Uh, it is based in the university, uh, basically, uh, Gothenburg in, in, in Sweden. The one difference between uh, the VDEM methodology and the methodologies that are followed by other organizations I will tell you a couple of them, two or three of them, so that we can appreciate what they are saying. Uh, there are two ways of uh, measuring democracy. A democracy is understood as uh, a system of government in which people are free to choose their government in a free, fair and periodical election and in which opposition parties have a reasonable chance of coming to power. And the choices are made in an environment where information is available to the citizens freely and from different alternative channels of information. So these are generally, this is a minimum. At the minimal level, the democracy is understood by most of these agencies. So there is a minimalist, it's called a thinner perspective of democracy, which is the Freedom House follows. That's where it stops. But then the uh, VDEM is on the other extreme of the continuum. It adds some more attributes. 
So two attributes which most organizations follow in assessing democracy in a world, in a, in a particular country, uh, they are political rights and civil rights. These are the two which are the, the minimal uh, criteria. Then there are others who added a few more, and this VDM adds three more. Uh, these are basically the more, two important of them are the participatory and deliberative aspects of democracy. The participatory aspects are those that where citizens actually uh, feel uh, kind of some kind of efficacy uh, uh, in participating in politics that they feel that they matter uh, in the society. And, and this goes beyond voting. This goes beyond voting. So uh -huh. it's not just you exercise your yeah. franchise uh -huh. at the national level once in five years yeah. and at the state, at the state level, level or at the panchayat level. Yeah. It's also not merely exercising certain freedoms of speech and expression, but it also goes beyond equality aspects, rule of law, uh, participation in politics, political awareness, and then there is the deliberative aspects, how far you are communicating with others, what kind of discussions you are having, whether you have discussions, whether you watch uh, news, etc. So there are certain deliberative aspects. So Vedam uh, people have uh, developed uh, quite a complex uh, methodology uh, to assess democracies of the world, and uh, many regard it as a kind of a thicker view of democracy. Okay. Yeah, that, that is, that's how the distinctions right. are made. Let, let me take you up on one of the points that you mentioned. And that's important in a democracy, the opposition, the role of the opposition in a democracy. And let me just draw your attention to a recent remark, uh, a recent article that was published in print on, on the 27th of June by this writer by the name of Kapil Komi Reddy. And he is the author of a book called Malevolent Republic, A Short History of the New India. And he says, I quote him, democracies can survive authoritarianism. They cannot survive the absence of an energetic opposition. And he says that is the great paradox of Indian democracy, that there are citizens uprising, but the opposition is fragmented, divided. There is institutional decay, even as the attempts at civic reclamation. And, and the fury of, of, of citizens get dispersed. So one of the reasons what many attribute to the weakness of the working of institutions responsible for upholding and strengthening democracy in India is the fragmentation and the weakness of the opposition. Your observations and comments. Yes, I think, um, just before I come to this point, let me finish the one more uh, aspect related to your earlier question. Okay. Uh, that is, Vedam, um, uh, like all of the, these the three institutions, and, and inc including Vedam, uh, it, its reports and assessments of democracy in a country are based on what, is, what are known ex, ex, expert surveys. So these are not public opinion surveys. So there are two ways of assessing democracy in a world, through a cross-sectional public opinion surveys and through expert surveys. So all, the, all these institutions, whether it is Freedom House or um, uh, or, or EIU Intelligence Unit, Economics or Intelligence International Unit. IDEA, or VDEM, they are uh, primarily based on uh, the perceptions of uh, country experts. Uh, that's, that's about uh, VDEM. Now, coming to the, your question on opposition, I think opposition is central to democracy. That's how democracies have evolved. Uh, the first democracies of the world, say uh, Britain and France, the opposition uh, evolved uh, from the beginning itself. Uh, you know, you heard about the Whigs and Tories in, in, in England. And uh, the very idea of democracy, I think, rests on the belief that uh, truth doesn't exist in one place. And truth can uh, be spoken by somebody else who is not in majority. So ex uh, respecting minority 
for the good of the majority, not for the sake of minority itself. Because if truth is known, everybody will benefit. Okay. It's so I think uh, we should defend uh, opposition to an idea or to a majority, and not for the sake of minority alone. So the freedom of speech and expression of an individual is what supporting not for the sake of that individual alone, but for the sake of larger society. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, that there is always a position in society, Paranjay. There is no society in which people are not divided on a particular uh, view or on a particular thing. Because people have different experiences, people have come from different backgrounds, and people have different perspectives. Of, re of the reality. So there are always division of opinions. And that society which tolerates a difference of opinion always prospers. Uh, that's interesting. This is that a you, historical thing. That is, and I think in democracy that gets institutionalized. That's the only difference. It's very interesting that you say this about uh, that a fundamental right of every Indian citizen, yeah. Article 19.1.2, uh, uh, 90, sorry, 19.1a of the Constitution of India. It's a fundamental right of every citizen. Article 19.2, which is more contentious, talks about the reasonable restrictions and the debate goes on about what is reasonable, what is unreasonable. Be that as it may, one of the factors that help strengthen democracy is a vibrant media. Yeah. And unlike News Click, much of the media in India, a very substantial section of the media in India seems to have abdicated, or ha I would say not seems, has abdicated its role as holding truth to power, asking difficult questions of those who are in power, and in, seem to be more interested in bashing the opposition. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is the first Prime Minister of India who has never addressed an unscripted press conference uh, or media conference where anybody can ask him anything. He has given interviews to selected individuals, including a, an actor from a Canada citizen who is also one of India's, or if not India's highest income taxpayer, who asks him questions like, how do you eat your mango? So I'm saying, Right from the top till now, it seems that freedom of expression and the freedom of, of India is under a huge threat, and that is weakened democracy. What are your views? I think the democracy rests on this uh, fundamental condition that people should get information freely from different sources because the reality out there is not one. It's, that's, it's how you see it. And only when people are allowed to tell others what they see the reality, and uh, that will allow citizens to form what we call more informed views. Uh, there are uh, scholars who worked on democracy. They mention this as a kind of one of the important criterion to assess a democracy, whether there is a free media. But if the media, as you are saying, that if some people in the media uh, have uh, not um, stood up to that kind of an understanding of conveying what they think is truth to the people in a fearless manner, that's not good for democracy. I think uh, the, 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 the purpose of the media is to tell people uh, and report to, uh, to them what is reality and give sufficient space to them to decide for themselves. I think if that happens, uh, democracy can be much more robust and, and vibrant. Okay. Uh, Professor Suri, 75 years of independence. And we've seen large sections of the foreign media, not the Indian media, being very critical about the state of democracy in India. 
I, uh, there's several articles which have appeared in well-known publications like the New York Times, Time Magazine, Washington Post, I can go on and on and on, where they have been very critical about the state of Indian democracy. And uh, I'll just give you one headline from the Associated Press, which is a leading news agency, an article written by Sheikh uh, Salik on the 12th of August, um, 2022. The headline reads, at 75, India's democracy is under pressure like never before. Would you agree with that view? Yeah, when it comes to uh, the perceptions of uh, Western scholars and Western media about Indian democracy, they have been skeptical about the survival of Indian democracy from the beginning. Uh, 1950s, uh, many of them said, uh, it's, it's not right to introduce democracy in India at that point of time because they thought that it was premature because uh, the preconditions for democracy were not there in India. And India was a vast society with great heterogeneity and India was a poor country and it has a large population. Illiterate, poor health care. Yeah, these are three conditions because the scholars have established three conditions that country has to be small and homogeneous and it should be reasonably prosperous. In fact, there were people who worked out a figure of what should be the average in, you know, annual income of citizens you know, for 462. <laughs> when dollars. women were allowed to vote in India in 1951 and 52, yeah. women of Switzerland were not allowed to vote. They were not allowed, yeah, they came much later. So there were fears because they said two things uh, that um, India cannot be simply a democracy because uh, it is, as you said, illiterate and, and it is also diverse, such a huge kind of diverse country. Uh, because uh, illiteracy was about 12 percent and uh, it was a poor country and so much of so many languages, religions, etc. And they were also even skeptical about the survival of uh, India as one nation, not, not, not merely as a democracy. So, but we have traveled uh, so, so far. Uh, in these 75 years. I, I will tell you that many democracy scholars in the West did not recognize India as a democracy till late 1980s. They didn't include in their study of democracies all over the world. They didn't include India. And uh, I know Robert Dahl, uh, who said that now India is uh, uh, a candidate for democracy. That was in 1980s after emergency. So only recently they started, uh, in 1990s, they started uh, calling India a democracy. Earlier it was. Uh, the Freedom House was there, it was called part, Partly Democracy. So, uh, I think, uh, uh, in my view, Paranjay, uh, Indian democracy has gained strength in over the last 75 years. But, and I'm interrupting yeah. you here, how would you trace the trajectory of Indian democracy from 2014 onwards, specifically the last eight and a half years yeah. of the Narendra Modi regime? Yeah, I think uh, there are uh, certain positives and there are certain negatives in, in, in this period. Uh, the positives are, uh, first of all, let me speak about the positives. The positives are, uh, now we have a situation where there is uh, a, a party at the national level uh, which is uh, national in the sense that it is spread over, all over the country. Earlier it was not there. There was, there was the Congress and then there were the regional parties uh, and there was the Janata experiment. And, and the BJP is now the pole of the polity. Yeah, of course. Which the Congress ha was for several for, decades. For, for several decades. So we have at least, uh, at least in 2014 I thought that here we have two big parties, the Congress and the BJP which is good for the country in the sense that there will be... But the be Congress kind of, has become very weak. Huh, or, or period. It is in power on its own in two states, in Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh. That's Chichisgar. the problem. That's it's in uh, power uh, it only in, uh, in, as a coalition partner in Jharkhand. I think that's the problem. I think that's the, your question again on the opposition. Uh, unless you have a equally nation, uh, a party with a nationwide spread, you cannot have a healthy democracy. So. The regional part, there are strong regional parties uh, are there, but they are, most of them are family forms. Uh, so, 
uh, how do we really, uh, at least in 2014, that was a situation, as you rightly said, Congress declined over the years and it was not able to look at the gap in 2014 between the Congress and the BJP or 2000. That widened in 2019. Yeah, and it widened in 2019. So that's the problem, so I think. You would lay the blame more on the Indian National Congress for the current state of India's democracy? I don't blame. I, I just look at the situation. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm saying that for whatever reasons, maybe the leadership crisis or maybe uh, Rahul Gandhi is able to galvanize that kind of a nation. Or unable, unable to galvanize. Uh, yeah, unable, that's what I'm saying. I don't say fail. Unable to galvanize that kind of a We are waiting opinion. for the elections to happen, happen in, in, the, in October. Yeah. And on the ne uh, and a second uh, positive I see is that um, in any democracy, Paranjay, that parties which have which are more ideologically oriented, whether they are on the right side or the left side, it is good if they come to power. Communists came to power in Bengal. Communists came power into to, came to power in Kerala. Communists are no longer in power huh. in but then, all states other than Kerala. But then they also get democratized. So, uh, so no. Are you trying to say that there is a link between the internal democracy within a party and and the democracy? No, I'm, uh, what I'm saying is you that could say that the BJP internally as is as undemocratic as the Congress. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. That is another aspect about party organization. I'm thinking of party ideology. Okay, all right. So uh, ideologically uh, extreme parties when they come, this happened all over the world. It's not only in India when they come to power they become mainstream parties and, and, and they, mo they get moderated. So that is one possibility I'm saying that in 2014 when this party came, to, it happened in before to 1998, then 1999, then uh, 2014. But the hope, that's, that's where the problem, the hope that this party would get moderated or, or this ideology gets moderated and becomes liberal is not happening because of the uh, because of the problem within all parties that are based on a, 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 a extreme ideology face this problem whether to moderate or not to moderate right. there is always this ambivalence because if you moderate the fringe groups will abandon this if you don't moderate the uh, the, ma the majority of people won't accept you. Would you see this do you see that this happening now within the Bharatiya Janata party i think that it, it has it has it has tried to moderate itself, but this is ambivalent. All right. Uh, that's where the problem is. That, that these are the uh, uh, positive sides, and there are also negative sides because at any point of time in a democracy, when uh, a party which is based on uh, kind of cultural nationalism, uh, a kind of you ideology. Want a Hindu of this, Rashtra. BJP yeah. wants a Hindu Rashtra. Hindu Rashtra. I mean, uh, people will call it majoritarian. Majoritarian. Uh, it's 15 percent of the population, one out of seven Indians. If they don't consider them, I mean, they will not officially be called second-class citizens, but effectively, yeah. they are. And that's the message kind of going through. Yeah. The RSS completes 100 years mm -hmm. in 2025. Correct. So I think uh, what, you, what you are saying, like media, opposition, etc., I think as a ruling party, uh, in a ruling party, in a democracy, you should also uh, recognize that... Uh, uh, a healthy opposition and a healthy media is good f for democracy. But do you think uh, Mr. Modi recognizes that? He has personalized politics in India like few others. Me versus Rahul Gandhi. Do you really, I mean he's repeatedly talked about a Congress Mukt Bharat, opposition Mukt Bharat. Mm. There are three, uh, there can be, one can imagine three dimensions of this. I don't reduce uh, a discussion on democracy only to uh, to persons. There are there are uh, uh, certain cultural aspects. There are certain institutional aspects. There are certain leadership aspects. I think democracy has its own logic. You mm -hmm. cannot reverse it. So the leaders will uh, will have to recognize this, and that pressure has to come from people and from civil society. Okay. So I'm sorry I'm interrupting you. We've almost run out of time. Oh, okay. So this is my last question to you. And I know it's difficult for a professor to give a short answer. Try and give a short answer. You know, we are described as the world's largest democracy. 
the United States is sometimes described as the world's oldest democracy. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on the 15th of August said India is the mother of democracy. We can define it anyway. How, and, and I mean, I'll give you another example. Uh, writer Nantara Saigal, I was reading something she wrote on the 13th of June 2022 in The Wire, where she questions, is India really a democracy? And the attacks on human rights, individual freedoms, makes her very skeptical. She quotes Bob Dylan's lines, the answer, my friend, is mm -hmm. blowing in the wind. So if I can request you to give us your closing remarks on the current state of democracy or the health of democracy in India at present. That's a good question, uh, Paranja. I think India is a democracy and I am proud of it. There are problems, there are challenges that we should overcome. And India has been facing these challenges, uh, both structural and cultural and institutional, as well as in the, in the, in the domain of leadership. So uh, the whole problem with uh, the BDM report that we started talking about, this classification is sometimes a problem. When you say this person is good and this person is bad, of course that resolves a lot of tension in us. But then there is something in between also that, uh, well, as you said, health and quality. It's not health, uh, it's, it's not that I get, I'm, I'm dead or, uh, suddenly, or I am healthy suddenly. It is a process. So in this process, you, uh, any society encounters difficulties. So one understanding of democracy, Paranjay, is instead of looking at democracy in terms of two categories, either democracy or non-democracy, I think that's the trap in which many people fall. There is something in between that we are becoming democracy. And this is a journey forever. This is a journey for the individual, how democratic I am in my life, and how democratic the society or my group in, in, the, in the social life, and how democratic my nation is in this life. You know? So well, look at 75 years, uh, the people's participation has increased, uh, their, 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 their capacities to uh, judge things have improved, it's called water sophistication. They are okay. more sophisticated today. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, in that sense, uh, democracy uh, has gained, but then there are challenges, as, as you have rightly pointed out, about the health of opposition, about the media freedom and freedom of expression. I think these are at the core of democracy, and if these are not fostered, nurtured, and, and, and safeguarded, you will not have a healthy democracy. Thank you so much, Professor Suri, for speaking to me and through me to the viewers of NewsClick. Make up your mind. Do you agree with Professor Suri or not? Is Indian democracy healthy or not? He argues that we have to take a nuanced view, but time alone will tell. We have about a year and a half to go before the next general election. Thank you very much for being with us on News Click. Keep watching this channel, subscribe to this channel, click on those buttons. Thank you very much for being with us.